thank you for inviting me down. We're certainly uh, in a very difficult time in history because we know that there's so much confusion going on in the world today and people don't know what the future holds. And it's interesting that 50 years ago I heard about Ezekiel 38. I had a lot to do with listening to the prophecies of Pastor Jack Clay over in Melbourne and uh, I was quite fascinated with what he could bring out of the Word of God. And I remember taking copious sort of notes at the time and then going back and then studying it myself. And over the years I've just learned a few things about Bible prophecy which is uh, quite interesting. Now, Ezekiel 38 is one of the main subjects that people refer to when it talk about the end time because it's talking about a final conflict that's going to take place and the instigator of this final conflict is called Gog and Magog and we'll explain what that means in a moment. It's in the book of Ezekiel chapter 38 so if you want to read it yourself but there's a lot in it that you'll have to pick up as you go. Of course from our point of view a scripture that I've quite often quoted but when it comes to Bible prophecy is the fact that God knows everything. And the Bible tells us to remember the former things of old, for I'm God and there's none else and there's none like me. He says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying that my counsel will stand and I will do all my pleasure. So God is making very clear that he knows what's going to happen in the future because he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. And he's letting us know certain things. You know, many years ago, I can remember people used to say, with well, the way the world was then, how can the world go much longer? The Lord Jesus Christ must return very soon. So we go on another three, four, five, six, and we've gone on in a couple of decades since a lot of people were talking about it, but nothing's changed. How can it get worse than it is? But it does. So... Ezekiel 38 refers particularly to a group of people that are identified by these two terms, Gog and Magog. We're going to point out, as you obviously can see, that it represents a country called Russia and we'll explain why that we believe it identifies them as Gog and Magog. And that their symbol of the hammer and the sickle is very much a name that they have is that they want to control the whole world. And so, as we see at the moment with all the trouble that's on in, over in the Ukraine, that there are a group of people, or led particularly at the moment by Vladimir Putin, that has no regard for other people's lives. To obtain the objectives that he wants, it doesn't matter who that he suppresses and puts down and even destroys completely. But we know that the Lord has a love for his people. And as the Old Testament people have called Israel. And Israel, of course, comes right back in history to the story of two brothers, Jacob and Esau, the sons of Isaac and Rebekah, right back in ancient history. But we actually find that these two people are identified as being a continuing source of conflict between the two brothers, and that it is not finished yet. In fact, the book of the Apocrypha, which is like an addition to the Bible, it's not able to be proved by Bible numerics, but it does bring out some interesting history. And what it actually states in the book of the Apocrypha is that Esau will be the end of the world, and Israel will be the beginning of the new world, the rock kingdom of Jesus Christ. Now, as we know, the word Israel means to rule with God. And that's, of course, ultimately what's going to happen. When the new kingdom is established on the earth, and if you look at the story of Daniel and the image of Nebuchadnezzar the king, the image is standing upon a rock that won't move. And that in type is Jesus Christ. That's the final kingdom. It's talking about various empires that will rule the world, uh, starting with the one at the time when the Lord revealed it, was Babylon and then there was of course the Medo-Persian Empire and then following Medo-Persia was the Grecian Empire and then finally there was the Roman Empire. 
Now the Roman Empire is just a subject in itself through Bible history and Bible prophecy. But it starts with the legs of iron and then it ends up with the feet of iron and clay. And this relates to the fact that Rome is the last kingdom. The last kingdom that will try to rule the world. In the sense that the iron and the clay is where pagan imperial Rome becomes papal Rome. And the objective of the Roman system today, the Roman Catholic system, and I'm not talking about people, I'm talking about the ideologies and their aims, and that is the fact that they intend one day that there will be a new world religion. In fact, the Pope is already setting it up. He's visiting all the religions in the world. doesn't matter whether they're Buddhist or Christian denomination types or whether they be Jewish or Muslim. He's saying we're all one. And we need to get together to save this world and we need to have a head of that organisation which is me. And so he's setting himself up as the head of the church of the world, the one world church, and he wants to be part of it. So this is where we have a whole system of things that are in place that ultimately they will fall. And we could talk a lot more about that. But we also read in the very last chapter of the book of Malachi about Esau. Now Esau ended up becoming a nation of people. They lived in Mount Seir, which is the city of Petra, and they almost couldn't be defeated, but they were defeated by the Romans that conquered Petra. And as the Bible says, the city will never be lived in again. And that's the place where we've got all the houses carved out of the rock work and there's a lot of history in that. And eventually it was the Romans that destroyed Mount Seir, which is referred to in the book of Obadiah. And then, of course, Esau shifted from there to south of the land of Israel. And they started up, which was called the country of Edom. Edom means red. So the red people moved down south of the land of Israel to the land of Edom. But eventually there was a great famine in the region and they had no food, but Israel did. And they started migrating to various paths just to exist. And what happened was that the number of the descendants of Esau actually went to Jerusalem and accepted the Judean faith, the faith of Judah, of the Jews, and in doing so, they were able to save their own lives. But it was almost as if that Esau disappeared from history. And people have often wondered what happened because the land of Edom was no more. They had no specific homeland. They were mixed among the nations. And it's interesting that when the Romans ransacked Jerusalem in the book of Ezekiel, where it talks about how that Esau was there. When the, the Romans were attacking Israel, Esau had 20,000 men inside the walls of the city of Jerusalem that started killing the Jews from the inside. So even though they accepted the faith, there was still a hatred for their brother. Because that's where the story is. A hatred of two brothers, of Esau and Jacob. So it was almost as if that Esau didn't exist anymore. We know that it identifies him clearly. Esau is Edom, and Edom means red. And it goes right back to the book of Genesis. But it's interesting that the last book in the Bible tells us that Esau is not finished. And this is what it tells us here, where the Jews, in the house of Judah, are still complaining to God. And he says, I've loved you, saith the Lord. And you say, being the Jews, wherein hast thou loved us? And God says, was not Esau Jacob's brother? saith the Lord, and yet I love Jacob, because he valued the things of God, and Esau had no belief and didn't want God at all. And I hated Esau, and I laid his mountains and his heritage waste to the dragons of the wilderness. This is talking about Petra. And so he didn't appreciate what Esau had done. It says, whereas Edom, or Esau, said, we are impoverished, we've been scattered, but we will return. In other words, we're determined we're not finished. And we're going to build up the desolate places, thus saith the Lord of hosts. He says, yes, they'll build again, but I'll throw them down and I'll call them the border of wickedness. The term today is the Iron Curtain, the border of wickedness. 
And it says, and the people against whom the Lord has indignation forever. Because Esau had no value on the things of God. And he actually brings the point out here in the fifth verse. It says, your eyes shall see and shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the borders of Israel. In other words, God's going to show his complete hand against Esau in the final conflict. And he'll magnify himself because he will be the one that will be supreme. And the Lord, of course, knows all things. We go to Ezekiel chapter 38, which is the chapter that we mainly want to look at today. And we read here, right in the beginning, Son of Man, which is just a reference to the prophet Ezekiel. He was used of God to record the prophecies. He said, Set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. So it's very clearly identifying that it's Esau in the background. Prophesy against him. Gog and Magog. Again he repeats it. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the Ogog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Now we'll identify those in a moment. Now an old uh, biblical dictionary by Dr. William Smith, many, many decades ago, long before there was the strength of Russia it is today, he talked about how that this was a prophetic use of the term and it related to the people of Russia. He pointed out that the name was actually directed by God in that sense over two and a half thousand years ago. And we read here that Rosh in Hebrew is Ras, A-E-S-S in Greek. And when it uses the term the chief, the word chief actually should be more correctly say the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. The King James says the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, but the proper translation should be the, the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. And of course the reason that it's so important that Rosh is Rus, equaling Soviet Republic of Russia. And it goes on to say this biblical notice of so great an empire, so it's talking about an empire that didn't even exist at the time, is doubly interesting in that being a solitary incidence and no other name of a, any modern nation occurs that way in, in the scriptures. So it's identifying clearly who it is relating to. The Holman Bible, and this is printed back in 1880, long before there was any thought of communism or anything like this, and it says in Ezekiel chapter 38, the word chief should read Magog the Prince of Rosh, as we've talked about, Meshach and Tubal. The Rus, or the Russians, are also mentioned in the Quran. And Meshach is believed to be the original Moscovy, the city now called Moscow, which is of course the capital of Russia, and Rosh is the name of the original Russia. As I make the point, long before there was any Communist Party. And so Magog, he went on to point out in another part, is a great Scythian or Scythian tribe that is now called Russia, or Russian. Dr. Schofield's reference Bible says about the Northern Confederacy described in Ezekiel 38, it's a primary reference to the Northern European powers headed up by Russia. And all biblical scholars in his time agree that Gog is referring to the Russian ruler or the prince, or today we'd say the president, Putin. He's taken that position. And Magog is the land. So Gog is the ruler, Magog is the land. And hence the reference again to Meshach and Tubal being Moscow, and the other city is the city of Tobolsk. Now Tobolsk today, which was Tubal in the ancient time, and that's a navy establishment on the Baltic Sea. So it's a clear mark of identification again back in ancient and previous times. The Amplified Bible puts it this way, that Gog is a symbolic name standing for the leader of a world power or powers antagonistic to God. And Esau never put any value in a relationship to God. He was antagonistic to God. And Meshach and Tubal understood to be Moshi and uh, Tibranai of the Greeks, the tribes that inhabit the regions in the Corsicans or north of the Corsican mountains. So we try and just identify quite clearly how the Bible puts it. 
goes on to say in the Amplified Bible, Rosh, which some would identify with Russia, must have designated a land and a people somewhere in the same quarter. And therefore the Gog of Ezekiel must be viewed in some sense as the head of the high regions in the northern part of Asia. Now it's not talking about Asia as we know it today, it's talking about Asia Minor. So you had the land of Israel, above the land of Israel, a lot of these tribes went to, and particularly the descendants of Esau as well, and that, that was called Asia Minor. And then it tells us that they then went beyond that, and they went north. And the reason that the Russian situation really developed was because of the fact that in 300 BC, Alexander the Great was such a tremendous warrior, unparalleled in his ability to go through countries and cities and just take them on his way through. Almost as it describes it in Daniel, as if his feet don't even touch the ground, he moves so quickly. When he came to Asian Minor, they got petrified of him and many of them migrated north to get away from Alexander the Great and the Grecian Empire. And that's how they started to establish themselves up in the territory today that we call Russia. As it goes on to say, Rosh, which would someone identify there, must have been designated a land and a people in that region. The Gog of Ezekiel must be viewed in the sense as the head of the high regions north of Asia Minor. Another Bible dictionary says Rosh it was forenamed over two and a half thousand years ago as Russia today. This early biblical notice of so great an empire is doubly interesting from it being a solitary instance. There's no other modern nation that's really identified so clearly as what Russia has been. And no other name of any modern nation occurs in the scriptures the same. Of course, there are the identities of following through the tribes of Israel and where they migrated to, that is a different thing. Fairburn's standard Bible encyclopedia puts it that there's going to be ultimately one day an invasion of Palestine, which really is meaning Israel, by a northern confederacy ostensibly led by Russia. So they're going to be the instigators, they're going to lead this force moving down. And the scene depicts, this is from Unger's Bible Dictionary, a gigantic outburst of anti-Semitism or anti-Jewish feelings and a colossal attempt to overrun Palestine with their aim to annihilate the Jews. Even the book of Psalms says that the aim is that the name of Israel will be remembered no more in history. That's their aim. It's all back to hatred that we're reading about of two brothers. Esau hated his brother Jacob. And that's another story as well. Here is an old biblical map that shows some of the things that we're talking about. And uh, it's showing the region down in the middle, there's Israel. But some of the things that are highlighted are that the people that were the Scythian people, and uh, that's you know, Gomer and Togamar and Tubal, and, and these identifications of these people that were in Asia Minor. But Magog was up the centre there, and a lot of the recordings are that these people, when Alexander came across from Greece, many of them moved north of the Black Sea, which is Russia today. So this is an old map that is showing the things that we're talking about. It even shows Ishmael down the lower part, which refers to the Arabs, and of course Israel is in the side there as well. And down the bottom is Libya, and you've got Egypt as well. That is an ancient biblical type map that again shows that these people are where they were. But the most important time, bringing it up to modern times, is the dating of the stage being set for the final conflict between Esau and Jacob. And the year is 1917 AD. 1917 AD was when the seven times punishment was fulfilled. You've probably heard quite a bit about that in Bible prophecy. And it relates to the time that the Jews were taken captive in 604 BC by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. You add seven times. A time in the Bible is 360 years. So it's a total period of 2,520 years in history. And if that's the case, then if you have the start in 604, you had 2,520 years, 
you come to the year 1917. And it was in 1917 where the Ottoman Empire, the Turks, controlled and had for nearly 400 years the land of Israel as we know it. And what happened was they were defeated by the Allied forces and led by Lord Allenby of Megiddo, who was the commander-in-chief of the Allied forces. There's a lot of story in that. And as a result of that, a declaration was made in British Parliament. And you wonder why is it made there in British Parliament? Well, there were Jews in the war effort in the First World War. The natural fact gave big advantage to the British over the German forces. And in return, they offered, particularly a professor called Hetzel, who was a Jew, a large sum of money. In a sense, a lot of what he did had saved their nation. And he said, I don't want money. But what I want you to ask is that you return my people to their homeland. In other words, he wanted a place for the Jews. Now, you've got to remember this is two and a half thousand years after they're taken captive. And before the war took place in 1917 in December, there was a declaration called the Balfour Declaration of British Parliament. That declaration of Balfour stated that any Jew of their own will could return to Jerusalem as their national home. I don't know of any nation on the face of the earth that's disappeared from their homeland to take it back again after two and a half thousand years. That was written in October and they didn't take the city until December, December the 9th. So you can see how that God again orchestrated things into place. And as a result, the Jews returned. So there were the Jews returned to Israel. There was the brother Jacob establishing himself in that time, back in the land of Israel. The very same year, 1917, was the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. And what happened there, of course, is that Nikolai Lenin and Trotsky, they took control of the country and they actually brought in the Red Army particularly Trotsky, and eventually it became the colour of the nation. And like we said before, that Esau is Edom and Edom is red. So why is it that these two men, Lenin and Trotsky, gave red to the nation? We'll learn that in a minute. So again, looking at some of the way that the Bible is lining things up now. Up the top, the land of Magog, Meshach, Moscow, Rosh, Rus, Russia, Tubal is Tobolsk, and they migrated north of the Black Sea. At the same time, and then Togomar moved across to the right to being above the top parts of Asia, Togomar of the northern quarters, and then of course you've got Iran is going to come. This is showing the people are going to attack the land of Israel. Libya, Ethiopia, Persia, we'll see those things in a moment. But just to put it in a bit of a map so you get an idea of what is going to happen, even though it hasn't happened yet. So we go back to the same year. So 1917, two things happen. Jews return to Jerusalem, right? That's Jacob's descendants. Secondly, Esau's descendants established themselves in the, the desolate heritages that we know today as Russia. The man that brought about the Russian Revolution, or what was called the Bolshevik Revolution, was this man Vladimir Yulianov. That's his real name, not Lenin. The interesting thing is, he was a Jew. He is an Idumean, Esau-descended Jew. And he changed his name to Lenin, he was born as Yulianov. And one of the things is that he hated religion. He demolished religion. And he brought about uh, the government's separation of the church and the state. And he even forbid religious instructions in schools. As you know, from the time that Lenin took the control of the country, it was 74 years before there was a church in Russia. And the reason is... If you look at it logically, man as a creature is incurably religious. 
Even people in the darkest parts of jungles have a belief in a greater and a higher being. And of course, the Russians were told, no God, no God. But after 74 years, they got precious and great that they formed the Russian Orthodox Church to have a belief in God again. So even though that Lenin tried to keep it out of there, and he was militant in his atheistic ways of doing things, he really wanted to separate everything out. But he was a descendant of Esau. And as we say, his real name, it was Yulianov. He was an Ashkenazim or Esau descendant Jew. He, along with Trotsky and others, formed the Politburo, which is the Communist Party, and Bronstein formed the Red Army. And that's how Lenin looks today. They've so reverenced this man in Russia, in Red Square, there's a mausoleum, and his body is still in the mausoleum, and it's completely controlled by temperature, and every so often they go in and they preserve the body again, and thousands of people a day still walk past the mausoleum of this man, of Lenin, and they refer to him like a god. So that's what he looks like today in his mausoleum. The other man was this man, Bronstein, that was his original birth name. Again, he's a Nijimean Jew. And uh, he became known as Trotsky, Lenin Trotsky. He was the leader of the Red Army. He gave the red to the country. But like Lenin, he did not believe in any religion. He said it was gross superstition and he wanted to eliminate and repress and uh, ridicule anyone that believed in a god or someone greater and use scientific enlightenment to make it clear. But these two brought in the hammer and the sickle and the colour red to the nation. If you go to Moscow today, here is the red star. It's something like around about three or four metres high. And from any part of Moscow itself, and that's Moscow Square, is lit up at night the five-pointed star of communism. And the colour is red. So we go back also to find that there's another objective behind Esau. And that is that one day he wants to rule the world, Esau. Lenin was an internationalist, supporter of a world revolution. The national borders were outdated and he wanted to bring in a socialist society that the world's nations would eventually merge together and result in a single one world government or new world order. So even that is, comes into being. But have a look at the coin on the side there. Or well, this is one of the symbols of Russia. Where is the hammer and sickle? Right across the face of the whole world. That is the ultimate aim. And above it, the red star of Russia talking about produce and everything else and the sun shining from the bottom of the wheat there, which represents, of course, the fact that they're going to be blessed in what they want to do. Make no mistake, the aim is domination of the world. Here's a couple of little cartoons that were picked up. And here's Russia getting hold of Ukraine. Trust me, I'm here to bring about a lasting peace. They want a piece of the Ukraine, as we know. There's another one there about being afraid of the bear. He's sitting up there. These little things that come into articles and magazines and things like this. Poor old America, you know, being gnawed off by the beast. And there's Putin there in all his glory as the great big bear of Russia and frightening everybody. Like they're just there with their little teddy bears compared to what he is, a ferocious bear. And uh, there's another one there. He's got Ukraine as the hammer and he's bashing it. All these little things come out, but there's so much truth behind it all. Going right back in August 1943, Churchill, of course, as we know, was the Prime Minister of Great Britain at the time. Even he referred to Russia as a bear. And Your Majesty will have noticed, this is a comment he sent in a message to the King, from Quebec at the time, he says that I've heard from the great bear that we are on speaking terms or at least growling terms again. <laughs> I thought that was rather cute. 
But again, it's identifying they are. Time magazine in 1994, the big bad bear awakens. And Moscow's neighbours fear that they may be the prey of a new post-Soviet empire. It's not that many years ago, but the big bear, the big bad bear has awakened, as we see in history. And there's Yeltsin, he was the president back in 1991. He didn't have much thought for democracy. And uh, here he is in his bear coat. And there's the bear with him. And it says, I'll meet them as a bear that is bereaved of her whelps. He's talking about a whelps being like a young. If anyone interferes with the bear's young, the mother bear wipes them off, destroys them. And that's just another little identification. But one of the other things it tells us in Ezekiel 34 is that time will come and says, I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws. And I know people have come up with various things that they think that might be the way that Russia is going to be pulled back. But the Cuban Missile Crisis, back in 1992, was when the President of the United States of America, John Kennedy at the time, and Khrushchev is there, and Fidel Castro, and the Russians were taking down in their Navy ships missiles to Cuba, because Cuba didn't like America. And the whole intent was that the Soviets were bringing all these missiles down to Cuba to face them towards America so they could knock them off if they need to do fairly quickly. And Kennedy realised, even though there was no legal reason to do it in a sense, he sent out his navy and he sent them to the point into the Pacific and he said to them, you go back or we'll destroy you. And they went back at that time. In other words, it wasn't time. It wasn't God's time, I suppose. That's probably the best way to put it, that be destroyed. But I'll turn thee back and put hooks in the jaws, pull them back until the time is right. That was the missile crisis in 1962. And then we read about this confederacy as well. And it says there that I'll raise up and cause to come against Babylon a great assembly of nations from the north country. And they shall set themselves in array and against her from thence she shall be taken and their arrows, it talks about arrows which today would be more missiles in type, of a mighty expert man. An expert man means a mighty destroyer and none of them will return in vain, they'll hit the mark. We've actually got that painting down at camp and it actually was from a Time magazine front cover in 1979 and it depicts Russia from the top looking down over the Middle East very interested in destroying his brother Jacob. So it had quite a prophetic term, the bear, Russia, and wanting to destroy it. But there's been an old world saying many years ago that history repeats itself. And that's exactly what's going to happen. You see, if we go back in the history of the empires, remember I mentioned that Babylon was the first empire described in Daniel. Right, So the symbol of, of Babylon was a lion with eagle's wings. Right, And we find that on the right there, it was the bear of Medo-Persia lifted up on one side with three ribs in its mouth that destroyed the lion with eagle's wings. We haven't got time to go into it this morning. But modern Babylon and the old flags of the papacy that flew over the balcony in St. Peter Square. They don't use it today. Someone probably pointed it out. His personal flag for the Pope was a lion with eagle's wings. And it goes straight back to ancient Babylon. And who's going to destroy it? The bear. And the Bible tells us that in Revelation chapter 18, and again we haven't got time to go into it fully, that there's a great nation it's going to come down and in one day and one hour will destroy Rome. That's what the Bible says. This is in Revelation chapter 18. There's a warning to God's people to get out of that system. And, but basically, it seems, and it doesn't tell us the timing, 
It's quite possible they'll destroy Rome before they attack Israel. And the reason I believe that's quite possible, and again, just from my reading, is that if you destroy the Pope and the Roman Catholic system, you demoralise the whole Christian world, which they hate. And that's in all probability why that they'll destroy Rome. It talks about the merchant men of the earth are going to mourn and lament because that eternal city is going to be destroyed. And I believe it's because they want to destroy, in the sense, anything to do with belief in God. But they destroy it on the way down. So we bring it through to modern time. The bear of Russia is going to be the one that will destroy Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. So the symbols are still there. Ancient Babylon was destroyed by the bear. Modern Babylon is going to be destroyed by the bear. There's a lot of other reasons why we can refer to the Roman Catholic system as modern Babylon, Mystery Babylon the Great. And to give you some of the history of it, describing how that this destruction will take place is in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 50. He says, I'll raise up and cause to come against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country. So this is talking about Babylon of old. So from the north of Babylon, they're going to come, they're going to set themselves in array, and their arrows will be like a destroyer, and none will return in vain. And then we read in verse 16 of this great army, it says, Cut off the sail from Babylon and him that handles the sickle in the time of harvest or destruction. For the fear of the pressing sword, they'll turn everyone to his own people and they shall flee to their own land. And that's, of course, what happened. Medo-Persia, the bear, destroyed, like reaping with a sickle, the uh, Babylonian Empire. And then in the same chapter, it says, How is the hammer of the whole earth cut asunder, and Babylon become a desolation among the nations? And from that moment, Babylon has never been inhabited exactly the same as Petra. As the Bible describes it, the hammer and the sickle of the whole world is going to be bringing about great destruction. It also tells us not only will Gog and Magog come down to attack the land of Israel, falling upon the mountains of Israel, we'll see in a moment, but others will side with them. Persia, Iran today, Libya, Ethiopia, all of them with shield and helmet. And this means they're ready for war, clearly. Gomer and all his bands, and the house of Togomar of the northern quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee. This is the massive army that's going to be led by Gog and Magog to come down and attack and annihilate the land of Israel and the Jews and destroy them as a nation of people. Mentioned in the scriptures, some of them have still got similar names today. They're clear marks of identification, but it's talking about war, isn't it? In verse 7, it tells us about this nation, the red people. It says, Be thou prepared, in verse 7 of Ezekiel 38, prepare thyself thou and all the company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. And Russia is a guard unto every nation under its control. Even recently, I was reading an article in the newspaper and it talked about how they still have the Iron Curtain. It's not a literal barrier. But the Iron Curtain, I looked up the meaning of it, relates to the political, military and ideological barrier erected by the Soviet Union after World War II to seal itself off and its dependent Eastern and Central European allies from open contact with the West and other non-communist areas. So they are the Iron Curtain people. They have a guard around them that others can't get through. So it talks about, in the Bible, that this great army is going to come out of the north parts. North of Israel, you can't go any further than Russia. They're going to come from the north. They'll come against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste, and they're going to attack the land of Israel. So they're brought back from the sword people, which were the Turks that controlled it. They gather out of many nations of people because they've... Since 1917, they've been returning from around the world back to the land of Israel today. And they've been brought forth out of various nations. That all fits the description of Bible prophecy. 
But this is the way the army is going to come in. Russia brings down a great confederacy with it, and it uses that term, a great confederacy of nations. And then you've got these people nailed down in Bible prophecy, Persia, Iran, Libya, Ethiopia, and many people with thee. They're just going to go in and try to wipe off Israel. As you know, it's only a little nation by comparison. It's just got a little strip of land. But even Jesus says, when you see Jerusalem encompassed with armies around about it, you know that the end is near even at the door. So the stage is set at the moment. And you shall see Jerusalem encompassed with armies and know that the desolation thereof is nigh. It's about to happen. Why are they going to do it? Well, they want to do something else. They want to take a spoil. And they want to take a prey. And they want to turn their hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon people that have gathered out of many nations, cosmopolitan, that have become rich. They've gotten cattle and goods and dwellers in the midst of the land. It's actually referring to the Americas. They're going to be attacked as well. And it talks about others that are going to side with the Jews. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tashish and the young lions thereof. Now, this is talking about the Scandinavian countries and is referring to the merchants of Tarshish was like their merchant navy back in history and the young lions of the Commonwealth countries. So in other words, the Jews are going to be supported by America and the Commonwealth countries. Right? So it makes it quite clear in the scriptures what's going to happen. But their intention is to take away silver and gold and cattle and goods from the West. The final conflict, as we're saying, is East versus against West in political terms. And so we read here in verse 8 of Ezekiel 38, And after many days thou shalt be visited, and the latter years you shall come into the land that's brought back from the sword, the sword people being the Turks, so it's again a pretty accurate description, and have gathered out of many people, because they've come out of all the nations of the earth to go back to the land of Israel, and they're going to come against the mountains of Israel that have always been waste, even when the Turks had it, it was not productive. But the desert will flourish like a rose, the Bible talks about, as the Jews have become one of the most amazing nations in that sense in the world. And uh, they brought forth out the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. They think they're invincible too, which is not a very good thing to have when you've got this massive people. But eventually it says they're going to ascend and come like a storm. And they shall be like a cloud that's going to cover the land. All thy bands and many people with thee. They will be attacked. We haven't got time to look at it all. It actually tells us half of Jerusalem will be literally taken at that battle. And uh, they're going to turn and cry to God. And then he's going to send them a saviour and a great one. And that's when Jesus Christ returns. But initially... The Jews are going to be defeated. Half Jerusalem will be taken. So it's going to be a massive war. But this man, Putin, has a strategy. It's obvious. One of the main reasons he attacked the Ukraine is that they were wanting to join NATO, the Northern Atlantic Treaty Organization. And if they joined them, then every other country that is part of NATO would have to fight against Russia. That's their agreement. And Russia knew that they're getting close to signing a deal. And then eventually, of course, they've attacked before that took place. So he's even put his forces on nuclear alert after threatening the West with consequences like you've never seen if it stands in the way. The other interesting, only in the last two weeks, is that all of a sudden, Denmark and Sweden it is, I think it was, in the Scandinavian countries want to join NATO. In the Second World War, they were neutral. They didn't want to get involved. But they're right next door to Russia. And they know very well that if they're not part of NATO, no one else will fight for them. And at the moment, the Turkish president, which is hand in hand at the moment with Putin, doesn't want the United Nations to let them become part of NATO, even though that technically he is still part of NATO at the moment. So there's a lot of political wrangling going on there. 
UK president, and we're only talking about March this year, he spoke to the Israeli parliament about Ukraine and Israel, and he said, we both face a threat of destruction. The Russian invasion is an all-out war aimed at destroying the Ukraine people. And that's why it resembles what the Nazis did to the Jewish people during the Holocaust. So he's letting Israel know, the president, Zelensky of Ukraine, is saying, you're next. So he knows, and probably they know that too, but there's the warning. Here's him talking about Vladimir Putin. I'm warning the West. We're one of the most powerful nuclear nations in the earth, and this is a reality, not just words. People have estimated they have 1,800 operational nuclear weapons. I mean, that could wipe the whole world out if it's placed in the right places. And they have another 7,000 stockpiled. So that's what they're like. Then there's another consideration, and that is there's another red nation that's hand in hand with Russia that is not condemning what's happened in the Ukraine at all. In fact, knowing from some contacts, the Chinese people have been told that Russia is a very friendly nation and that America is the aggressors. They never see any news reports of Ukraine on their television sets. They're not allowed to be shown. It's banned. Why? But there is Jinping and he's shaking hands with Putin. They're in it together. They're having military exercises on the boundaries between the two nations. So it's not painting a very pretty picture. So the Middle East, and this is an old Time magazine front cover, is in conflict. But it's not only that, Islam is involved as well. And they'll side with the Russians to destroy, they hate the Jews. Because Islam is Ishmael descendants, the Arabs, and they hate the Jews just as much as Esau hated the Jews. So it's really right in the middle of it. But like it says, that what's going to happen is in the middle of attacking the land of Israel with all this great confederacy from the north, and we read here in verse 11 of Ezekiel 38, and they shall say, I'll go up to the land of unwalled villages and I'll go to them that are at rest and dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. The terminology gives us a clue. I will go up to the land of Amor villages, to people that have never been fortified, have always been free. And we know that's the Americas. And it's the reason they're going to attack, as we've touched on before, they'll take a spoil and a prey, they'll turn their hands to the desert places that are now inhabited, and upon the people that gathered out of the nations, America's not that old in history, and they're gathered out of the nations, America's very cosmopolitan with various nations in the country, which have gotten cattle and goods, they're rich. So they're going to go up. If you go up from Russia, where do you go? Over the North Pole. So it's very clear the description from the Bible is very accurate. I will go up to the land of Amor villages. America knows they've got spy planes in the air in Alaska, as you see at the top of the slide, which belongs to America. And it's one of the states. And they have spy planes in the air watching any movement of any missiles or anything from Russia. They know they're going to be attacked or come over the top. But it's a good description from the Bible. Trade over, bypass Canada, and knock off the United States of America. It all fits into place. But the Bible tells us that this is all going to happen. And the words of Jesus, Luke 21, Matthew 24, just sort of in summarising it, there'll be signs in the sun and in the moon and the stars at the earth, on the earth at that time, there's going to be distress of nations with perplexity, with no natural solution. The seas and the waves will be roaring, tsunamis and so on, men's hearts failing for fear, thinking about those things that are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven will be shaken. It's a rather good description that Jesus spoke about, that these things will happen before his return. And so it tells us in verse 18, of Ezekiel 38. It will come to pass 
that when God shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury will come up in my face. So in other words, God is going to let it go so far and then he's going to be angry. And it says, For in my jealousy and the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day, as they're attacking Israel, there's going to be a greater shaking in the land of Israel, he tells us. And I'll plead against him with pestilence and with blood. I'll rain upon him and upon his bands, talking about Gog and Magog. And it says, And upon many people that are with him, overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. It could be conventional war, as it indicates, might develop very quickly into nuclear-type war. But the Lord says, ultimately, in verse 23, Thus will I magnify myself. So God's going to show that he's superior to any nation or company of nations that wants to try and alter where his blessings are in the land of Israel in that regard, even though they've got their problems. He says, thus will I magnify myself and sanctify, set myself apart, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. They're going to see the hand of God revealed, and they will know that I am the Lord. So... You know, amazing description of the final things that are going to happen at the end. But it actually tells us that Gog and Magog will be destroyed. And what's going to happen here, and we're cutting a bit of it out for time, is that it gets to the point where there'll be that many dead when God's hand judges Esau, judges Gog and Magog, that tells us that they'll be like dung upon the ground. And what it says here, it will come to pass in that day, they will give unto Gog a place of graves there in Israel, a valley of the passengers. A passenger means the the mouths of the passengers saying great things on the east of the sea. And it shall stop the nose of the mouths of the passengers, the passengers being this army coming into the land. And there they will bury Gog and his multitude, and they shall call the place where they're going to be buried the Valley of Hamangog. The word Hamangog means the Valley of the Multitude of Gog are going to be buried in a big valley. God's already got that in mind. It's not just a few grave holes. A whole valley is going to be filled with the enemy that fight against God in that sense. And for seven months after that this stops, they'll be still burying the dead in the land to cleanse it. Israel will be burying the dead for seven months straight. And all the people of the land will, shall bury them, and it shall be unto them a renown the day that I will be glorified, saith the Lord. They're still looking for the Messiah, the Jews. They're going to get a big shot when he comes back and shows who he really was, that they rejected and wouldn't have him to rule over them. They'll have no opportunity to change it because as we know he'll be the king of kings and the lord of lords and it says even after the seven months we go on to read they'll set out men of continual employment passing through the land to bury the passengers and those that remain upon the face of the earth to cleanse it at the end of seven months they'll still search for more and the passengers that pass through the land it means anyone going through the land seeth a man's bones They're going to put a marker or sign beside those bones and the barriers will go out and find the bones at the end of the markers and they'll pick them all up and they'll take them to the valley of Hamongog. It's pretty descriptive, isn't it? There they are. (laughs) That's what's going to happen. They're going to set a sign behind it and even the bits and pieces are going to be collected and burned up. As we know, we're not going to go into it now. The final conflict is Armageddon. And it says, Behold, I will come as a thief. Jesus comes as a thief at night. Blessed is he that watches, that keeps his garment. Garment means the garments of righteousness, that he be found naked or in his sin. Lest they see his shame. And he gathers them together in a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Armageddon is a name for the hills of Megiddo that's in the midst of the land at the beginning of the plains of Esdralon and that's the great army place where the biggest army in the world is going to be assembled against Jerusalem 
We also know that there will be three evil forces in the end. This is just a bit of a summary of things that the Lord is going to be dealing with. The mouth of the dragon, which is atheism and unbelief. The mouth of the beast, Roman Catholicism, and the mouth of the Pope. And the mouth of the false prophet, which is Islam and Muhammad. So all these things are going to be dealt with at a moment of time. And that's what it says that will bring about a place called and a battle Armageddon. And so the Lord says when we see these kings coming to pass, then you shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud. And the clouds of heaven from one side of the earth to the other are going to be a screen to show Jesus Christ returning. But he says when you see these things start to come to pass and we're really seeing it at the moment, then look up. The only way to escape the problem of this world is to be looking up to the Lord. Lift up your heads for your redemption or your salvation is going to draw nigh. As it says, for as lightning comes the east to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And all the people said, Amen.